Um, so big thanks to John and Tim and the, the Net Caucus folks for, uh, for having us today. Uh, it's a very exciting panel, uh, big data and AI, the policy implications. Um, so uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, so we have an hour. Uh, we're going to do some moderator Q&A for about 45 minutes and then open it up to audience questions at the end for about 15 minutes. Um, so we'll keep introductions brief to get right into the discussion. Uh, so as, as John mentioned, my name is Joshua New. I work for the Center for Data Innovation. We are a nonprofit, nonpartisan public policy think tank studying the intersection of data, technology, and public policy, and we're affiliated with the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation. Uh, so going down the line, we have Dean Garfield, who's the CEO and President of the Information Technology Industry Council. Uh, next to him, we have Leanne Levensailer, who is the Senior Vice President of Corporate Strategy at Workday. Then we have Neil Tilson, who is the Acting Chief Technologist at the Federal Trade Commission. And finally, we have Chris Calabresi, who, who is the Vice President of Policy at the Center for Democracy and Technology. And just to start, uh, if everyone wants to take about two or three minutes just to set up their background and uh, kind of contextualize the, the perspectives that they're bringing today. You want to just go down the line? Sure. So, as Josh mentioned, my name is Dean Garfield. I have the privilege of working for 62 of the world's most dynamic and innovative companies. Many of those companies are at the forefront, including Workday, um, are at the forefront of driving innovation in augmented or artificial intelligence as well as big data. Uh, because of that work and the conversations that have been ongoing around those issues, we think it's important for the sector generally to be clear about our responsibilities, as well as to be clear about the collaboration that's necessary for both AI and big data to fulfill their potential. And so because of that yesterday, or perhaps the day before they all run together now, uh, we released principles around AI, policy principles around AI, and I look forward to talking about them with all of you. Hello, everyone. I'm Leanne Levensailer, and I'm from Workday. And Workday is a cloud provider of applications for human resource management, financial management, analytics. Uh, we uh, were born in the cloud in, two, in 2005 and uh, stay in the cloud. And we, have, um, we help companies uh, manage the intersection of people, money, and technology and serve as really their enterprise backbone. So today I, I'm hoping to bring the industry perspective to the panel um, to talk about some of the uh, opportunities we have with building products um, that sort of reflect our expectations of consumers for the enterprise and some of the differences um, that are created as, as a result. And, um, and to talk about what our customers, the kind of questions our customers are asking us and how we're developing with our customers in sort of this new world order. So I'm delighted to be here and thank you for including me. Good morning. Uh, my name is Neil Chilson. I'm the acting chief technologist at the Federal Trade Commission. And the Federal Trade Commission, most of you uh, probably know this, but is the uh, primary privacy and data security enforcer in the US. On top of that, one of the other missions at the FTC is competition uh, enforcement. And um, somewhere at the intersection uh, of those, uh, AI kind of spreads across both of those, AI and big data issues. And we have done a lot of research uh, into this area. Today, we're, you know, we've labeled this a discussion about AI, but a lot of the similar issues uh, were raised in the, uh, the big data context. And uh, the FTC did a workshop and a pretty uh, detailed report on some of the issues in the big data space and what laws um, and apply already, and then what, uh, what ways that companies might want to um, make sure that they're complying with those laws and how those laws uh, address the concerns that might be raised. Um, I recommend that report to your review. Uh, I think it, it does cover a lot of the issues and gives some good background on what the current legislative landscape is. So I, I look forward to talking about these issues. Hey, everybody. I'm Chris Calabrese from CDT. Um, CDT is a 20-plus-year-old advocacy organization, sort of all things Internet policy. Uh, we feel very strongly that, you know, continuing to protect the Internet user, their privacy, their free speech, their freedom from government surveillance, their ability to innovate is at the center of what makes the Internet work and makes, what makes it such a powerful medium for all of us to use for so many things. Um, we're excited about the potential of AI and big data. 
Um, we really think that it can be a force for good. Uh, we believe very strongly in the power of data to help people, but like any powerful tool, it can be good and it can you know, harm people as well. It's a tool. And so we've been working for several years to articulate exactly where we think the bright line problems are, and we'll talk about some of those things, where we think the potential for success is, and what all the people who are using AI, the companies and the individuals, how they can employ it in a way that protects people, that protects both their rights, and also you know, protects them against harms like discrimination. So looking forward to the conversation. Great. Um, so to start off, uh, just because it's so timely, uh, Dean, could you take a minute to describe uh, the policy principles that you all put out for AI, specific, you know, what they are, but also why industry felt motivated to kind of be proactive about doing this and then get uh, out ahead of this issue? Sure. So in simplest terms, our, our view is that as we talk about artificial and augmented intelligence and having machines that have networks that build on cognitive uh, knowledge that we're gaining in general intelligence, that as human beings, we should act intelligently as well. <laughs> and so we should think about the implications of what we're doing, uh, develop policy principles that help clarify what our commitments are and how we're thinking about our ethical and broader responsibilities, uh, as well as where we see gaps that, as Chris pointed out and others have pointed out, Leanne pointed out, uh, we need to address. And so just to drill down a little bit, we want to be clear about making sure, for example, that, that human safety is, and that when as we develop AI systems, we have systems in place to ensure the safety uh, and security of human beings, the people who are working on, on those systems. Uh, as we integrate data and big data into analytics as well as AI, that we're making sure that we are pulling that data from diverse uh, entities and, and places so that we are not ingraining bias in our innovation uh, and also testing rigorously uh, to ensure that over the long term uh, we're not doing that as well. And so the principles are clear about the importance of taking on those societal ethical responsibilities. They also endeavor to be clear about where we see a, the need for greater collaboration. And so they're also a call to action. How do we, in, ad in addition to ensuring we avoid bias on the data that we use, ensure, ensure that AI is broadly deployed to all communities that can benefit them, from farming to pharmaceuticals to financial services? Uh, we are big believers in the potential but that is if we do certain things to ensure the potential is, is achieved. How do we begin thinking about accountability frameworks, uh, for example, uh, creating the insurance pools that are going to be necessary for highly autonomous uh, mobility, for example. And so it really, AI is just being deployed commercially but I think it is advanced sufficiently in that it's now here that we can see where there was a need for clear commitments uh, and where there are gaps that the private sector can play a critical role in filling. Great. Um, so that one was targeted towards Dean, but as we go along, I want to keep this conversational, so feel free to jump in if you have anything to add. Feel free to challenge each other. That's always exciting. Mm -hmm. um, so to, to elaborate on some, on some of the issues that you mentioned, uh, bias in big data is, is always a prevalent concern. Um, but for, from a person who doesn't you know, work with the technology on the, on the technical side of things, it can be kind of hard to understand how bias can really be present in what's basically math. Um, so, Whoever wants to, could you try to ex explain how bias can enter uh, into these kind of systems and what that actually means and whether or not it's, you know, and what companies can do to prevent that from happening? So whoever wants to. I'm happy to just talk a little bit about kind of, so at its most basic level, what we're really talking about is a recipe, right? A formula for achieving a particular result. So you can, bias can creep in in either of those cases, right? It can creep in in the ingredients you're using for your recipe, and it can creep in, you know, in what you're trying to accomplish. So let me use a very basic example. 
you can say that the most important thing I would like my algorithm to do is hire successful employees. Okay. That can mean a lot of things, right? So what do, what do I want a successful employee to look like? You have a number of outcomes there. Maybe one you pick is, I think a successful employee is one who stays in the company a long time. Okay, that's cheap, you know, that's effective, good. That's what, we, that's what we've decided we want our algorithm to do. Now, so I go and look, well, what are the criteria that keep people here a long time? One of them might be they live closer to the, to the place where the, you know, their employment is, right? Shorter commutes mean longer retention. Okay, so that seems to be a right, relatively straightforward, straight line, but where people live turns out to be a fairly highly, not discriminatory, but people tend to, to cluster in particular areas. We still have a lot of segregation in this country. So the reality is if, you, if you're a suburban employer, your decision to favor people who live closer to your place of employment is likely to have a discriminatory impact on the kinds of people who you get. New, seemingly neutral outcome, math as you say, but the result is potentially very discriminatory. So how do we then build our algorithm to factor that in? How do we audit it? How do we lift up those and much more complicated algorithms and look for those outcomes? So I think that's sort of what we're, some of what we're grappling with. I'd like to add on, um, you know, Workday, my organization, we help company with, um, companies with data analytics. And so, you know, about four years ago, we started with uh, the kind of the question about can we help people connect with work better, right? It's a pretty fundamental question about managing workforce technology. And, I th and you know, we, uh, we set off our data scientists and all these um, very smart people kind of with a large data sets, you know, uh, working with our customers saying, okay, go find, go find some patterns and let's, let's build some algorithms here. Um, it's a lot more complex than that, but just for uh, simplicity's sake. Um, and without functional experts uh, supporting those data scientists, they found all sorts of inputs that might be interesting, all sorts of ingredients for the recipe, to use Chris's example. Um, but what we, what we learned through that process, it was essential to get the functional domain, the, the product managers, and the customer experts with them to actually help shape what ingredients to pick up. If you're going to make a lasagna, it's very different than making a chicken stew, right? So you, you got to know, you got to have the right kind of ingredients to get the outcome that you want. Um, and those functional uh, leaders and, and organizations and our product leaders are really aware of, we, we spend a a tremendous amount of time thinking about unintended consequences and bias in all sorts of areas of the business. And so having that, um, having the right kind of designers or the right kind of cooks is very important, we learned. And not just leaving this to a pure technology exercise, but actually more of a functional exercise. So I think that that's really important to add to your example. And I, I would just jump in and, and give some uh, context from the FTC's perspective. In the big data um, report, I would say bias kind of, uh, let me back up. There's sort of two injuries that we hear a lot about from, or potential injuries from AI or big data. One of them is, a sort of, is inaccuracy, and the other one is uh, too much accuracy. So just, just to kind of bone those two together. Um, Bias kind of falls in the first category. The, 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 the challenge is, is the company getting the results it actually wants? Are they, are they, are they getting what, what their outcome was? Uh, and are they trusting the, the algorithm too much, but the algorithm is wrong? So in that situation, I think it's really important, uh, you know, the FTC does have this competition expertise and economic expertise, is it's really important to put this in the sort of business context, and I thought Leanne did that very well, but on the more abstract level, companies have a lot, in, a lot of incentive to get the right answers. That's why they're using these techniques. They want to get the answer right. And so when we think about how we might address these through enforcement or legislation, we should look at what incentives companies have. Now, that's not, uh, that's not always true in all of the types of harm that might come out in AI, and we should try to identify the areas where the incentives maybe aren't quite right and where we need to look for, for, for uh, solutions to that. But in the bias category, to the extent that it's about getting the wrong answer, um, companies have a, a strong incentive to get the, the right answer there. And so I would put that in context as well. It, 
If just and, and also beyond the, it's worth it's worth we're talking about this in an industry context. But algorithms are being used constantly across society, right? So police are using algorithms to decide where to police their neighborhoods. Like it's called predictive policing, but that's essentially what we're doing, right? And so it's worth just thinking more broadly about what incentives everyone kind of has and and how they may or may not you know care. So. One great example, I think, of an algorithm that is completely broken and I think very intuitive for people is there was a designer who wrote a great essay, and I, if I can find his name in my notes, his name is, uh, is Paul Sorer, and it's, the, the article is, The Code I'm Still Ashamed I Wrote. And essentially what this code did, it was a test aimed at adolescent girls, and the test was you were supposed to do this test and then it was supposed to kick out what you needed to fix this particular problem. But what the test always kicked out was a particular pharmaceutical company's drug. That was always the answer to the test. So if that intuitively is an algorithm that is broken, because it's not reliable, it's seeming to tell you something that, you know, as a consumer you would expect, but yet only is telling you what the, the sort of person who's putting the algorithm in front of you wants, you to understand. So I think as we think about this harm, we have to think about what the incentives are of the people who are creating the algorithm. And, and that's obviously a very bad algorithm. And it's something that you know wouldn't pass anybody's smell test. But it's interesting to think about another harm besides bias, which is your algorithm may not fit with the expectation of the person using it. They may think they're getting a particular result, whether it's a hiring manager or, or someone else, but in fact, they're not. And so that disconnect can be another harm that we have to think about. It is important to um, not paint with a broad brush here and separate out consumer use cases versus enterprise use cases, because I, I do think that there, there's a lot of differences. And what is big data versus machine learning or in the category of artificial intelligence. So, um, you know, we, we can't have a one size fits all model as we, as we think about policy or as we think about a code of conduct or standards here. So important that, um, you know, we spend a lot of time educating our customers too on the differences. And, and I think, you know, there's a lot of things that enterprise software or industry, you know, software built for industry um, can take cues from the consumer world, and there are a lot of things that they, they shouldn't. But, you know, you think about how enterprise uses machine learning today and big data really to improve customer, the customer experience, to improve logistics, the supply chain, um, to make a better worker experience. These are not nefarious methods of getting them to buy you know, a certain product or a certain drug. Um, these are really to improve the overall operations of an organization, make them much more efficient, to help them focus on innovation. Uh, and so even, you know, we deliver features to our customers that, that are infused with data and are, use machine learning to continuously enhance the experience. But we also, Workday, uses machine learning to improve our platform technology to detect anomalies and fraud and all, all other aspects of making our service run uh, more productively. So I, I want to be careful here that, that we don't take a narrow path down a discussion um, and that we look at the opportunities that are afforded to organizations and the differences between the consumer world and the, and, and the private. Uh, one of the, the encouraging phenomena that I, I've observed, which builds on that, is in the similar way to in which privacy by design is increasingly the norm, or cybersecurity is increase, by design is increasingly the norm, Inclus inclusion by design will ultimately become the norm in machine learning as well as data analytics. A and why I think there is an increased prospect of that happening quickly is because one of the things that, that we do continuously is to make sure that we're testing with rigor. Uh, and the companies do that exceptionally well. Workday is one of those. And that's why there was a comfort level in, in articulating that as one of the principles. In addition to having the right algorithm, testing the algorithm to ensure that it's not broken is normative behavior, and it should be. And, and I just, and I want to just be clear, I completely agree. I mean, mo not only are most algorithms benign and, you know, that they have a tremendous, you know, potential to, to help, you know, society and improve innovation. Uh, Kathy O'Neill, who wrote a, a fairly famous book in this area called Weapons of Math Destruction, who's, in some people think, is sort of a little bit of a, a 
of an algorithmic pessimist, if you will. I mean, even her, one of her principal points is, we should be focusing on a relatively narrow class of algorithms that have the real potential for harm or direct impact on consumers, right? So we're concerned about employment. We're concerned about when consumers get credit. We're concerned about, um, you know, all kinds of sort of direct, you know, health care and, you know, direct impacts. But we, again, shouldn't sweep with a broad brush and say, and, you know, and say, hey, if you want to improve how a product gets from a, you know, a warehouse to a store to the customer's hands and your, you know, your inventory management, that, that's, you know, we don't want to sort of say algorithms must do all of these things because it can interfere with unintentionally with all of these other areas. So it, it's really important to, to kind of focus on uh, about not just the, the concrete harm, but just think about the decisions that are having the maximum impact on, on individuals. Great. Um, and so I actually do want to come back to some of the topics that Kathy O'Neill raises in her book. Um, I have my issues with them, but it's a good way to set up the discussion. Um, but first, uh, so on this issue of fairness, we talked about what companies can do, what they should be paying attention to. Uh, we've seen some proposals um, and some, some sentiment from, from folks at the FTC for this idea of algorithmic transparency as a way to police against bias to make sure that systems are not being discriminatory or that companies are like hiding behind their algorithms to be nefarious. Uh, the problem is when you ask people what that actually means, what algorithmic transparency is, you get like five different answers. So, uh, you know, like the, the epics and EFFs of the world say complete open algorithms and underlying data all has to be publicly scrutinizable, uh, where you have other folks who say, like, what we really want here is algorithmic accountability. So Ashkan Sultani, formerly at the FTC, said, you know, algorithmic transparency is the goal of the FTC, but we really want accountability. Uh, we want to be able to identify where bad things are happening and stop them without, you know, disincentivizing innovation, and we want to have a productive relationship with, with companies. So I guess starting with Neil, um, has that sentiment changed at the FTC? What do you, how do you all define algorithmic transparency, and is that always a worthwhile goal? Well, here I should say um, that probably like Ashkan, uh, my, my topics, what I say is it represents my view <laughs> and not necessarily the view of the commission um, or the commissioners that are there. Um, uh, so with that said, with that said, uh, I think, <laughs> I mean, transparency is, is, a, is, a, uh, is something that the FTC does look at um, as one method in, for example, advertising disclosures. It's one way that we make sure consumers are making informed choices. Um, in the algorithmic area, I would say the goal is still the goal of uh, the FTC overall, which is to prevent unfair and deceptive acts or practices. Now, transparency might be one way to get there, but transparency isn't cost-free. A lot of the algorithms that we're talking about now, deep learning, transparency is very difficult to figure out how to do with those algorithms, um, but they're more accurate than, you know, the sort of expert, you know, systems that we might have used for AI in the past. And so, uh, requiring transparency would would in some cases require less accuracy which has its own injury to consumers and so that trade-off is really uh really important to consider um transparency uh, i have some other thoughts on it and i'm blanking on them right now oh so well you know some algorithms like i said some can explain themselves and some can't um and the other big problem is and we've talked about this uh, you know the ftc is a competition place again and focuses a lot on intellectual property, there are some challenges to pure sort of algorithmic openness from a competition perspective. You would, if, if you required somebody who developed an innovative, new, very accurate algorithm to then disclose that um, it, to the public, it could be very challenging. That reduces the incentives for people to develop algorithms like that that are, that are accurate. And so I think that, that could be very concerning uh, on an industry perspective and, and also not uh, on balance uh, beneficial to consumers. Um, and so I, I think when we talk about transparency, you're right, there's lots of different ways to talk about it, but we need to think about the trade-offs that are possible, uh, that, well, that, that exist in, in requiring transparency. Well, I mean, I would just say we tend to think about it in, in two ways. Really, it's auditability and it's, um, ex I would call it, yeah, explanation or explainability. So I, I agree there. It's difficult to just sort of give you the source code. But what I think a consumer wants and should expect is first 
so what we would call explainability or an explanation. So I should understand what what's what I can do essentially as a con consumer to succeed with this algorithm. So think of your credit score. You may not understand precisely how the algorithm works that spits out a credit score, but you should have some idea of what you need to do as a consumer if you want a better credit score. Similarly, Google's page rank, right? You have some idea of what you need to do in order to make your page more attractive to Google's search engine. Right, you might not, you don't need to, but you do need to be able to interact with these algorithms in a, in a meaningful way. And similarly, the algorithms need to be audited, right? They need to be able to, there needs to be a way for you to sort of essentially prove that they're working the way they say they should work. And, and whether that's putting a bunch of different inputs in and making sure you're getting the, the outcomes that you expect. We think those two prongs will help kind of consumers get with it, you know, know what they should expect, and it will help to kind of make sure that regulators can, can hold, you know, companies and algorithms feet to the fire. So th those are the kind of the two pieces we can see. If I can make a couple, I'll try to keep them brief, maybe four quick points. Uh, one, this is an active area of research uh, that should remain so. Uh, two, when we think about new technologies and innovation, it's our instincts as human beings to graph what we know onto new things. And so we think about explicability and transparency around algorithms in the same way we think about it around source code. AI is not driven by so source code. Uh, the, the part of the differential is with source code and the way that we think about computing today, it's driven by linear logic. And so the way adults may think, while with AI it's experiential, so the way that a two-year-old would think by reinforced learning, uh, very different and, and creates important distinctions when you talk about issues around transparency and explicability. In the principles, we think about it in two respects. One is explicability, uh, with, with the idea being there's a lot of work being done in this area, but how do we think about explaining the implications of the algorithm in a way that helps people to understand not only the outcomes, but the, not only the inputs, but the outputs? Uh, and then second, how can we begin to think about accountability? So what are the frameworks that we need to put in place to ensure that if things do go wrong, which they're not humans, the level the, and likelihood and probability of wrong is lower but not zero, who is held accountable and responsible? So in the most tangible term, an automobile, uh, if you have an highly autonomous vehicle, how do you begin thinking about an insurance pool and designating responsibility when there is an accident? The answers don't exist today, but it's important that we begin thinking about the framework, the principles that would go into how we create an insurance pool, because that's critical, right? In the same way that we have insurance today, we want to make sure that insurance exists in the world of tomorrow. I think um, from a transparency perspective, I, I agree. We're, we're still learning active area of research, and we should continue that. Uh, just from practical experience, our, uh, you know, our customers will say, um, just like any feature, frankly, I need to understand how this was computed, how it was calculated. Um, and so there's sort of two levels we like to think of it. One where maybe the, the buyer or the administrator or the, the leader might need to understand actually how, you know, how, how we are, um, you know, building the algorithm, how we're treating it, and how much data is informing and influencing it, you know, because data, because these are learning systems, they amass over time, and it gets more reliable and better with more data. They're data-hungry applications, if you will. Um, so that's one level, and, and, and frankly, with or without any kind of regulation, any kind of policy, customers are just asking for that as a preferred experience, right, for working with us. And the second is the end user, the, let's say the worker, the manager, the multi-level manager, if you give them a scorecard and you say a metric is up or down, they kind of want an explanation, don't they? Um, they want to see additional reports. They want to know how that was calculated. They want to know why. They want to know why from the system and then why annotated from maybe another human being. And so we get that pull. Similarly, if we make a recommendation on a piece of learning content, they actually want to know why they made it because you had the skill, because you have this job interest. And so I think the user experience, both at the administrative and the end user, are dictating transparency 
and and I and I like that pull. I like I like how we're um, kind of learning into this, and so not to overuse the word learning, but growing into this. Uh, new capability, yeah, but much could, research is needed. You, you made me think of one other thing that, that helped me to understand a lot of this. So I, in many respects, AI is, is as if, is if computer science meets cognitive science. And the brain is the organ of the body that we know the least about. Mm -hmm. And so in the same way that we're now understanding human intellect in a way that we never have, it, it, we're creating these neural networks that are multi-layered and rely on statistics and rely on data analytics to see patterns. As that evolves in the same way that the human mind has evolved, we'll be able to come up with rules and principles that may guide our behavior. We don't, not to suggest that there aren't gaps that require government engagement today, and we identify a bunch of them. But we just don't know enough today to be able to say these are the rules that should be put in place for the next 30 or 40 years. I think that would do more harm than good. And so not a suggestion that we don't need rules. It's just a suggestion that a recognition that we are really in the learning phase. Uh, and so we have to make sure that we're putting rules in place that are flexible that will evolve as our, our level of knowledge evolves. One area, if I just uh, just because the autonomous cars example is such a fascinating one to me. One thing, like the learn, we are still at the beginning of this, right? There are going to be more and more decisions made autonomously, and they're going to have bigger and bigger impacts. One thought exam experiment that will help you think about how hard this is going to be for regulators. So, assuming there are autonomous cars in the near future, and I, I believe that there will be, there will be a point at which you will be driving along in your autonomous car. And the, the, the car will have to make, or the algorithm will have to make a split second decision about whether you or the three people in front of you should be the victims of the accident that is about to happen, right? Some, there is going to be a car accident. The car, the car cannot avoid it. Somebody has stepped out into the street. Should the driver bear the harm? Should the person on the street bear the harm? That, you know, these split second decisions happen all the time on the road right now, and, pe and people are making those decisions, right? There's going to be a point where we know, it, with just because of the number of, of thing, you know, the number of transactions, the number of times and, and decisions that are made on the road every day, that this is going to happen immediately. So as we think about, you know, AI and we think about decision making, we have to understand that these are, these are really high stakes decisions. And so understanding both how the algorithm is going to make a de particular decision and at some point putting our thumb on the scale potentially and saying, no, 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 we think you must make a decision, for example, that the least number of, you must ca cause the least amount of harm to people, no matter who those people are, whatever, whatever way we decide we want to put the thumb on the scale. That's really important as we try to think about these algorithms, and those are sort of the stakes we're playing at, too. And all algorithms aren't made equal to, um, and, and I know everybody, everybody here know, understands that, but there are, you know, big data is just taking very large volumes of data and, um, and finding patterns in that, right, and, and showing, up, showing those um, to folks. Um, whereas machine learning will, will help you, you know, make some decisions, make some recommendations, kind of uh, think, think on, its, on its own based on what it learns from interactivity. But at the end of the day, the user is still in control, right? And that's not in the car situation that you outlined is, is almost an extreme example. In almost all these cases, if I make a recommendation, that's simply more input to make a more informed decision, more evidence-based decision. And frankly, in the world I operate in, there's a lot of art in management, not a lot of science in management. And so we could, we could you know, grow a lot as a professional body around human resources and people management if we just put a little bit more data and a little bit more science behind management. So I, I also want to be careful we don't lump big data and um, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and neural networks all together with any kind of policy or regulation. They do rely on algorithms, and there are some, some similarities some commonalities, um, but we also may make sure we pull those apart as we're thinking about these topics. Sure. Yeah, just as human beings, we, we make decisions every day based on risk, right, and how you treat 
one level of risk is very different than you treat another level of risk. We cross the street, we don't think anything about it, but you may not want to jump off a cliff, you know? And so I think that's, you know, part of this is we think about the level of risk that's involved, uh, treat different things differently. Well, and I, I think it's also really interesting, uh, Dean, you brought up the sort of comparison between the adult and the toddler, the linear thinking of the adult and the kind of instinctive holistic. I think what we've learned is that adults are very good at explaining a linear, like they can say, well, this is probably why I did that. But when, you, when they're making split level, yeah. split <laughs> second decisions, they don't yeah. go through a sort of logical step-by-step -step process. And I think that's something we've learned from AI about the human brain. And, and I think that's really important to keep in mind, especially when we're talking about you know, automated vehicles and there's this sort of, because it's called artificial intelligence, we sort of have this idea that in the car, the computer is thinking, well, what are the moral, <laughs> what are the moral like, choices here? Am I gonna kill three people? Am I gonna kill one first? That data set and that sort of conclusion is very hard. Um, I, I don't know that cars collect enough data to be able to say, well, it's gonna kill three or it's gonna kill one. I think they, um, a lot of them, they're going to be split-second decisions, and they're going to operate very similar to how humans do split-second decisions. Well, because we've trained it. Yeah. Ultimately, right. yeah. we train the data set initially. Right. Right. Humans have, humans have input on the front end and generally on the back end, right, and most often on the back end. So I think that's really important as we think of the, develop, the design development pipeline and the action to, to, over to execution, that humans are involved all the way along, right? And, it, and let's not lose sight of that. Unequivocally, I agree, but also it's worth saying there are times when we talk about the value of AI, we talk about improving on human decision making, right? And that's part of the reason why I want to take bias out of hiring, for example. We want to improve on the human decision making. So at some point, somebody's going to say, well, yeah, it's been trained so that the, you know, and the training set, I suspect, is always going to favor the driver saving their own life, right? I suspect that's what training set data would, would tell you, right? A regulator or someone else may not have that, just, maybe it won't, we'll, we will find out. But, you know, at some point somebody is going to want to weigh in to, to sort of make an improvement of however they view that improvement, and that's where things will get very interesting. Yeah, so what Chris is alluding to, and I'll just say out loud because for those of you who work here at Congress, is, uh, is the idea that policymakers would be involved in defining algorithm and, and essentially leveraging AI to drive those decision making so that the algorithm would evolve based on the rules that are set by a third party, namely Congress, and evolve as the algorithm improves based on the decision of the uh, And there are a number of academics who are advocating that, uh, basically using machine learning to drive policy and principles and rules that are set. I, I think it's a, it should stay in academia, at least for the moment. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I want to ask one more question, and then we'll move on to audience Q&A. Um, so Chris, what you were just saying, I think, sets us up perfectly. Uh, so we were talking a lot about bad things that could happen with AI. I want to make sure that we talk about the good, thing, the good things that can happen, be a little bit optimistic. So, you know, there's all these concerns about AI creating unfairness or perpetuating unfairness, but the world is already really unfair. There's human subject, subjective bias in everything we do. So what are the opportunities that AI can, uh, redu can, can increase fairness? And I guess from a policy regulatory perspective, what, how can we encourage those kind of applications to develop? So I I mean, I guess I'll just give two real quick. I mean, the first one is, so bail decisions. Are, there are already people playing with the idea of maybe we can automate some of the bail decision-making process, right? So typically, you stand in front of a judge. It's a two-second decision. It's not surprising. A lot of people think there's a lot of bias in that decision, right? Well, you look at the person, and you sort of make a decision. Um, potentially, the right algorithm can improve the outcome so that we know who actually does, you know, re-offend and, ma and make decisions there. So that's one area, and that's a, there's going to be a lot of work there because there's, our, there's so much bias in the existing data set, it's a hard training exercise, but it's, it's a potential area for real improvement. The other one I will point to, because there comes a time when people stop understanding that these are all part of the same cloth. So, Google's search engine is a pretty awesome algorithm, right? We have come to take for granted that you can type 
something in and get like the perfect answer back, or at least a really good answer. Like there's a tremendous amount of computing power going into that. So it's worth thinking about how many times, and it's not just Google, of course, it's across the tech space, but how many times we take for granted that we're going to get exactly the right recommendation or exactly the right response. And, and that's all powered by this, the, you know, the same ta technology. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the realm is truly vast. You know, I mean, from farming to pharma to, uh, to financial services. So half the people in my wife and my family, have, our direct family, have cancer. Um, both my wife's mother and her sister died from cancer. And cancer is, a, is in some respects a misnomer because uh, breast cancer may have more in common with diabetes than it does with prostate cancer. And the, the part of the key there is early diagnosis. Well, when I visit a doctor, when my mom's, my wife's mother visited a doctor 60 years ago, the likelihood that the particular doctor you went to had access to the latest innovation as well as the latest research study was slim. But because of big data, the likelihood that they have access to finding out uh, the key patterns that would lead you to diagnose cancer or that particular type of cancer early is real and substantially increased. I pride myself on paying attention when I drive, but sometimes I look away. The, the, I have, we have two girls. The number one killer of kids between 15 and 24 is dying in a car accident, number one. So if you're between 15 and 24, the place you're most likely to die is in a car. And so 94% of traffic accidents are caused by human error. We look down and our car plows into something. And so I happen to be lucky and have a car that will stop. And it's happened many times where I've been distracted and my car will stop autonomously. Um, and so it's in our everyday lives today and I think it makes us better and will make society better as a result. I would just add that we serve some of the, the largest companies in the world and you know, trying to understand patterns and um, you know, find those, um, find the hidden talent in an organization of 300,000 people or 100,000 people it is quite challenging. So from a, you know, an opportunity standpoint from, you know, really using technology for good, I think companies becoming smarter about their people and their money, um, helping them to run more efficiency, efficiently and taking out the data, daily drudgery, whether it's with a bot or it's better data, you know, to inform some of their decisions or automatically do something that used to be managed. Annual. It creates a better experience. People feel they're doing higher value work, um, regardless if you're in a quick serve restaurant or you're in a financial services institution. It, 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 there's, there are examples across the board. So I, I think both with big data and with artificial intelligence, you can create a bit better experience and better business. And so I'm, I'm, I, re I remain very optimistic about our future. And I would just add in that uh, the, the big data report that the FTC did was called Big Data a tool for inclusion or exclusion. And there's a, a bunch of examples in there of ways in which big data is already being used to help people who are at a disadvantage in society um, uh, currently. And I, I think there's a lot of potential there. Um, we've seen it. I think the most explicit one has been in sort of offerings of credit, um, new, new algorithms, new ways to, to find the credit worthy people who have thin credit files um, just because they don't have a they haven't had access to data and they don't have a history. And I think that's, that's, a, that's an area for a lot of potential uh, benefit to people who, um, who, who could benefit from having access to credit like many of us do. You reminded me, sorry. Uh, I feel like I need to plug CDT's report stuff. You, you did a good job <laughs> of that. Uh, if, if you're interested in more on this, uh, CDT's site is cdt.org and it's digital decisions. Is, is what we, we put all of this stuff under, so digital decisions, if, the, if you want to hear, hear this spiel in a slightly longer form. Thanks. Great. Um, so with that, we're going to turn it over to audience Q&A. Um, I don't know if we have a mic or not, um, so I guess you'll just have to project. Um, so uh, I guess when I call on you, uh, just say your name and where you're from as well. So, so there's no mic. 
No. Okay. Uh, my name is Jerry Hush, and I'm coming in actually new to DC from having worked within the UN system. So I've been dealing with issues of complexity and uh, the capacity to make decisions based on a variety of tools. So first of all, thank you very much. It's been wonderful to hear some of, a group of people engaged in what I think about all the time. So I want to actually pinpoint just one particular issue, and that's risk and risk assessment. And I want to link that to the idea of interoperability. Because, and I'm going to link that actually to the issue of food safety. Because we have, we're actually in the midst of a food sort of crisis today. Um, if we understand that the algorithms and the underlying frameworks of these new, I'm going to say techniques actually, are based on certain logical frameworks, epistemological assumptions of what's out there. If we accept that, which I think is an accepted conversation right now, then what is going on around the world in building algorithms associated with that big data in those cultures, how are we going to begin to deal with the capacity to link these various data sets, for instance, around food, if we're going to, let's say, look at commodity trade, okay? I think that's an extremely important area that brings together a lot of these issues, and I'm wondering if anybody is thinking about who's doing what with that. Yeah, you, good. Yeah, so I was actually just a part of a conversation um, with the folks at IARPA, and so the director of IARPA was on a panel that we did when we rolled out, and he identified the same issue as being absolutely essential in an area of opportunity for greater collaboration between the public and private sectors. We, we've talked about data banks uh, and interoperability of data banks. If you can donate blood, why can't you donate data? How do public private sectors work together on these issues? Part of the AI as a terminology has been around since the 1950s, but the commercialization on the B2B and and business to consumer side is relatively new and so I think being persistent in calling out these issues and figuring out how we can get at the same table to work through them is absolutely well, part of putting out the policy principles was to actually focus attention on the gaps uh, and so we intend to use some of our power as a convener to try to drive uh, collaboration around this very issue. I think on other fronts been successful about advocating for open data and using the API economy uh, to facilitate interoperability. And so while I'm not an expert in this area in particular, I think that that's pretty, it's essential that we, we operate against some standards around open data. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, so um, Mark Hernandez from Representative Derek Coleman's office. Uh, so in my previous life, I was an aerospace engineer and cognitive scientist. Um, sort of combining that with pilot decision making. Um, and I want to push back a little bit. Um, what if users don't ask for accountability? What if users don't care about transparency? We see this in FBI face recognition systems, predictive policing, where they just say, oh, they told me where to go, I'm good with that, let's go. Um, what if recommendations aren't seen as in innocent suggestions, but actually often when people interact with these computers, they see them as, oh, they must have so much data, I'll just follow a suggestion. Um, or if algorithms don't match human decision-making processes, thus the call for transparency and explicability, right? If they actually didn't match us, we wouldn't need that. It would be obvious. Um, all of that. Um, I understand your regulatory concern. Aerospace engineers have, we have we're, with drones and all these other things, we have our own concerns as well. Um, where should we be in terms of regulatory? Like, where, where should this conversation go? Not, the sort of expand this flexible regulatory approach that you outlined in your, um, your document. I just want to say really quick that ties on. Uh, so Representative Kilmer, uh, last Congress and then earlier this year, introduced the Open Government Data Act, which would codify federal open data publishing requirements, which would be super good. And that would help address some of the issues that you were talking about. So we hope it passes. Uh, I'll jump in on that. Um, I, I, so one of the things that we didn't really talk about is what, what the current legislative world looks like. And the Big Data Report did talk a, about um, how Congress has addressed very similar concerns that rose, and in, in I, I would call it the first uh, Big Data Act, which is the Fair Credit Reporting Act, which focused on the concern that some computers somewhere distant away were making decisions about whether or not you got credit. 
And so I think the focus, I think in the legislative world, the focus has been quite appropriately on what is the specific harm that we're trying to stop and how can we, um, uh, and, and, and what, what laws do we have in place? We should ask that. What laws do we have in place that address some of that harm? And, and FICRA is one of those, but we have in the, in the bias sector, we have a lot of uh, equal opportunity laws um, that are enforced by a variety of agencies. And I think uh, the question would be, how, how do they address an, this issue? And if they don't, how can we uh, expand them or, or adjust them so that they do? And then on top, I, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, mention the FTC's own Section 5 authority uh, which is its consumer protection authority um, to prevent unfair and deceptive acts and practices. And, and uh, we've, we've focused on these, um, these cases for a long time, and I think uh, we're one of the enforcers of FICRA. And so um, uh, I think there are tools out there, and we should look at how those are working before you know, we try to do something big and call it AI legislation necessarily. Yeah, I mean, I, w I would agree with that. I mean, in, in lar by and large, I mean, you do want to start with the areas that we've been worried about using data uh, in for a long time, so employment, credit, housing. And there's interesting gaps already starting to form, right? So there's a question about advertising for credit, for example, right? So before I make an offer of credit, obviously I advertise to people for credit. And that, you know, used to not be such a big deal, just put lots of ads out. and. But you know, even then, there was a worry about what people were seeing and what kind of offers they were getting. So that problem is, of course, supercharged by the idea of targeting, right? That you might only be seeing offers of credit. If you're basically just getting behavioral targeting, you may only be seeing offers of credit of a particular type. And that may be based on, on data and it may be based on machine learning. So, OK, that seems bad. If you never know that there are 12% credit offers out there and you only are getting 20% credit offers, that's something that's a, a discrete example of something that we would want to worry about and think about. And so I, I think that we, can, we start with some of these areas where we've got issues and we begin to think about what the technology is actually doing right now and the decisions that are being made. And, and I think we build the framework around that. And, and part of it is, I, I guess it's worth emphasizing here, this is still fairly new stuff in terms of what we're working on and making sure that, like this has been really, I, I feel like one of the more constructive conversations where we all are kind of talking on the same, about the same things and we may have slightly different calibrations of what we're worried about within that framework, but that's a relatively new phenomenon, at least in my experience. Uh, I, and, I mean, I think having smart people like you who have experience engaged on these issues is critical. I would also say let's prioritize. So in areas where we see the greatest risk, let's put those first and figure out what models we have already to deal with those risks and where there are gaps. And so I think part of the misunderstanding about the principles is a lot of newspapers anyway have read them to suggest that we don't want any regulation. I think there's an important role for government here. What we were suggesting is that coming up with AI legislation will, will do more harm than good. So if we want to talk about machine learning or algorithms, whatever it is, let's disaggregate, prioritize, and then figure out where there are gaps and then try to solve for them. And ultimately, this is about the kind of society we want to create, right? It's supposed to be human enhancing, not replace us and that's why I started with the point of we should act intelligently if we're talking about creating intelligent machines and so we have to make decisions on the broader goals that we have in mind uh, and create rules or principles that align with that and I would I would also add that in the paper I'd be remiss if I didn't say workday is also promoting the papers on your chairs <laughs> here since everybody else did but um, that we're advocating for an industry code of conduct to, to, to sit in line with these principles because I agree not everybody's going to ask for the how did you arrive here um, we we've had some experience uh, internally to workday with working with our customers where we've had to adapt or develop a set of shared principles that we will innovate with and for our customers in a, in a, in a way that is consistent with our values and, and the expectations, which are in, in large part what we're advocating for broader from the industry to adopt. And so um, I happen to come from an excellent culture that focuses on that, but we, we really want to advocate for the rest of industry to adopt those same set of principles working with customers. So I, I would submit that as well. 
Great. Um, and I just want to make a brief plug. Uh, in terms of where policymakers should be, something a constructive way we could think about what they should be focusing on if they want to pass legislation. Uh, Many other countries, Canada and China in particular, have launched very comprehensive artificial intelligence strategies, uh, massive investment, uh, you know, very clear delineated goals of how they're going to lead the world in AI. Um, and I think there are very substantial competition issues, values issues, if a country that does not share the same values as the United States leads in the technology, and we have no such strategy. Um, so food for thought for future legislation. Mm -hmm. um, so it's 12. I'm told we have a hard stop, but there might be some chance to mingle. Uh, or it's one o'clock, excuse me, uh, to mingle afterwards. Uh, so please join me in thanking our panel today and the NET Caucus for putting this together. Thank you.